Good morning, Brother Bob. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Okay, yeah. Somebody was adding an extra good morning there, but we'll, we'll take it. It is an honor and a privilege to be in the house of the Lord one more time with each and every one of you, and it is always truly a blessing to see your smiling faces. We've got a couple of quick announcements this morning, so please bear with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your continued faithful giving to Ramoth Baptist Church, its missions and its ministries. Our tithes and offering are taken there in the foyer at the two desks and the two containers there. Know that you can give your tithes and offering there, and if not there, know that you can give it online. If not online, know that you can drop your tithes and offering in the mail or by the church office. But whatever you do, continue to give with a cheerful heart, knowing that you are blessing God's kingdom. Amen? As Brother Sam Rainey mentioned last week, we have barbecue coming up. The homecoming kickoff coming up on September 25th. There are going to be loads of barbecue there. I'm going to tell you like I told first service. If you are not there, I am going to eat your portion of barbecue. I, I'm going to eat, if you are not there, I'm going to eat your barbecue. Now, I'm asking all of you to be here to help me eat that barbecue because otherwise they would not be able to roll me into church come Sunday. So mark your calendars, plan on being here September 25th. That is a Saturday and that will be from 3 to 6 p.m. Skate night tonight, 6.30 to 8.30 over at Cavalier Skating Rink. I've said that I'm going to be there to watch uh, others attempt to skate. I will not skate because then I would not be here next Sunday. Uh, I would inevitably fall and hurt myself. So please uh, come out, be a part of this time of fellowship. Uh, skate if you can, uh, spectate if you can't. Uh, but please, uh, again, Cavalier Skating Rink uh, this evening, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. <laughs> And that's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> uh, the March for Life, uh, an another uh, item for your calendar, please. Uh, September the 17th, uh, we're taking a group down, um, down and over to Richmond to take part in this march um, against uh, abortion. But please, uh, if you are inclined to be there, make that known. Uh, reach out and get any additional information you need from Pastor Chuck, but we would like for you to be a part of that. Again, mark your calendar September 17th. I want a club. Okay, this is an important announcement for any uh, young adults or youth that would be interested in working, uh, any parents who would be interested in getting their young adults or youth to work, or if you've got kids who will want to age. There are cards in the foyer for you to fill out if you have anyone that is represented in that category, someone who can work, somebody who should be working, or somebody who needs to attend. Please uh, pick up one of those cards, fill those out, and get those back to Ms. Robin as Awana starting off will be right around the corner. Uh, if there are any questions, please, again, contact Ms. Robin, who is our children's ministry director. And then uh, we just recently sent um, some of our students uh, back off to, to school uh, to start the next term of, of college. We've sent some. Um, there for the first time, we sent some off to the military. If you have a young adult who has uh, left home, we would like to be able to stay in contact with them. There's another sheet of uh, paper there in the foyer. There are lots of sheets of paper in the foyer, uh, but please get their contact information for that young adult who is no longer at home here so that we can reach out, give them a word of encouragement, be in prayer for them, and just um, keep them up to date on what's going on here at Ramoth. That's in the foyer. Right now, the, the conclusion of today's service, there will be our deacon election. Um, the deacons will pass out ballots to those who are members for them to vote on the four candidates that were presented last week. Fill that out, give that right back to the deacons so that that uh, process can be completed and we will have the results for you in the next week or so. Our deacons of the week are Chris Terman and Brian Dork. 
Uh, their contact information is there on the screen if you have a prayer request, an emergent need, or just need someone to speak to during the course of the week, these gentlemen will be readily available to you. And if for whatever reason you are unable to connect with them, know that your church staff is also standing by. Those are our morning announcements. Please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, we humbly come before you, your throne this morning, thanking you and praising you. Thanking you and praising you for health, life, and strength. Thanking you and praising you for another day to worship you as the true living God. Lord, we thank you for your messenger, Dr. Richard, as he comes to present your word. We thank you for Pastor Chuck, who leads us in songs of worship and praise. And we thank you for this body of believers who greets and engages one another in truth and in love. Well, we thank you for just this opportunity that we have to gather around your word, to hear it so boldly proclaimed, and to have it change each and every one of our lives. Lord, we just ask now that you would bless this time of service, that you would move where you need to move, and that we would be receptive to your moving. We also are mindful to continue to pray for our nation, continue to pray for its leaders, and continue to pray for the servicemen around the world as we're dealing with a lot of uncertainty right now. But the one thing that we are certain of is that you are still in control, and we thank you for that. Lord, bless this time of service and all that is to take place in it. And we pray these things in the name above all names, the name of your Son. Jesus the Christ, and all of God's people said, amen. Thank you, Woody. Good morning, church. Good morning, morning, church. Oh, my. Do you just like to hear me say it twice? Is that what it is? Let's make him say it twice. Don't say anything the first time. Oh, my goodness. You're talking about barbecue, right? Barbecue at that homecoming kickoff. Everybody likes barbecue. Yeah, I saw a report this past week, and it says if you eat a hot dog, it takes 36 minutes off your life. I don't know how many years I have lost already. If you eat a handful of nuts, you get 26 minutes back. If there's, a, if there's something about barbecue... Just don't even tell me, okay? Keep that to yourself if you know about that. And I don't know why people are doing studies like that anyway. That's crazy. I hope you'll come to our barbecue. I hope you'll come to the homecoming kickoff. We're going to do something a little bit different. Would you stand, please? You see, we have Deuteronomy 10, 17 up on the screen. I would like you to read that with me together. So I want you to actually read it out loud. Let's do that. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, mighty, and awe-inspiring God, showing no partiality and taking no bribe. We have a great God. Will you turn to the person beside of you and say, Welcome to Ramoth. God is great. Oh, yeah. It takes a long time to say that, doesn't it? Welcome to Ramoth. God is great. I think think you guys are just wanting to talk to each other. You want to, would you do, let's do this. Look at each other and tell them how God is great. Go ahead, I'll wait. He made you. (laughs) How is God great? Maybe tell them the ways that God is great. Okay, I'll help you. How about this? God is great in the fact that he completely supplies our every need. That's awesome. Amen? Amen. Amen. God is great because he is patient. I have tested his patience. Maybe you have too. God is great in his faithfulness. He keeps his word. God is great in his power and his might. That's what we normally think about when we talk about God's greatness. He is great. He is strong. He is mighty. God is great in his sacrificial love. 
Amen? That's my personal favorite. God loves us to the point that it's sacrificial. We're going to sing how great is our God. We're going to sing about how great God is. Would you join me in singing? Let's sing this together. Above all names, the name above all names, for you are worthy of all praise. My heart will sing, How great is our God! Let's sing it again. The name above all names, for you are worthy. great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all oh, will see how great, how great is our God. Quan grande es Dios. Continue quan grande. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God. 
Uh, we look at Psalm 63, verse 4. And it says, so I will bless you as long as I live. At your name, I will lift up my hands. We're going to sing, lift your name. Let's sing to the one, the only one who is worthy to be lifted high. Now in the morning when I rise. Now in the morning when I rise. I will lift your name on high, and I will praise you, and I will praise you. I will lift your name on high, and give you glory, and give you glory. I will lift your As the battle rages on, we fall to bend in need to pray to you, and in defeat or victory, we will lift your name on high, and we will praise you, and we will praise you, we will lift Yes. 
Almighty God. You are glorious, Almighty God. Oh, let's give our God a hand clap of praise this morning. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to uh, the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 13. We'll begin reading in verse 26, reading through the rest of uh, the chapter. Uh, we are in part 12 of the Experiencing God series, and it takes uh, another turn this week, and we'll see that in just, just a moment. It turns back to us again, as it did uh, previously. So stand with me if you would. As we share together from the book of Numbers, chapter 13, beginning in verse 26. The spies have been sent out now to uh, explore the promised land, and they're coming back uh, with their report. So in verse 26, they came back to Moses and Aaron, and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We saw descendants of Anak there. The Am Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Armonites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Father, we thank you for the report that you've given us of the Israelites as they had visited the promised land, and it was everything that you told them it would be, but they walked in disobedience. And Lord, we pray that we learn from that this morning that as Israel walked in their disobedience they faced the consequences of that disobedience the same is true for us today as we walk in disobedience we will suffer the consequences that Lord we pray that our hearts are open to receive the message that we learn from the mistakes of the Israelites that's why you've uh, placed this here in your word that we might learn from it I pray our hearts are open to receive it, and we give you the praise and the glory for all that you'll do here this morning, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. You may be seated. Now, for the last 11 weeks now, we've been looking at what a personal relationship with God would look like and the many ways in which he communicates with us. And we discussed how we can experience God in a personal relationship in our lives and how we can realize that He is always at work. We must never forget that. He is always at work. Regardless of what our circumstances might be, God is always at work. Now, God pursues that love relationship with us, and it's a very real 
and personal relationship. It's not uh, just a hit and miss. It's a very real and personal relationship that God pursues. And we talked about how he invites us to join him where he's working and in what he's doing. And we determine where he's working and then we are to adjust ourselves we are to adjust our priorities to join him in that work and we've talked about how he speaks and reveals himself through the Holy Spirit we see his purposes and his ways to us and we see his uh, his scripture we see his word We see how he speaks to us through that scripture. We see how he speaks to us through prayer, through circumstances, and through the church itself. And now it's time for for our response. It comes back to us. God has spoken. He is telling us what type of relationship he wants to have with us. And now the question comes back to us. What's our decision? What's our response To all that God has said to us. And God is speaking. But are we listening? Are we listening to what he says? Are we turning a deaf ear, so to speak? Are we walking with him? Or are we walking against him? Are we walking in obedience? Or are we walking in disobedience? This morning, what I want us to do is to see what happens when we know what, what God is, is saying, when we know that he's speaking to us, what he's calling us to do, and then what happens when we don't do it. That's kind of like the parent-child relationship, isn't it? The, the child will push you to the limit. They know what you've told them. They, they heard it. But have they accepted or rejected are they walking in obedience or are they going to walk in disobedience and we're we're no different and when we find ourselves in that type of situation many times what we experience in that situation is what Dr. Blackaby has called throughout this particular uh, study and we've, we've touched on it briefly for the last several weeks. He calls it a crisis of belief. And we're going to look in depth at that this morning. A crisis of belief. And you might say again, well, well what's that? What is it, really? And I've stated that uh, it starts out with, I believe, but do I really believe? It's a crisis of belief. And it goes a little further because it becomes a a turning point where we make a decision to follow God or to walk in disobedience. And that's what happened to the nation of Israel when the spies came back. They gave their report. It was now time for their response. They had a decision to make. Are we going to walk in obedience or are we going to walk in disobedience? Are we going to... To walk the right way, or are we going to walk in the seems right way? Well, we know what Israel's decision was. They walked in disobedience. They walked in the seems right way. And they suffered the consequences for that decision. And this happens today in, in the lives of, of many believers and even churches. There, there's a great divide, it seems, in what God calls us to do and what we actually do. And we make the wrong choice because we really don't believe or we really don't trust God to see us through what he's called us to do. And we're really not sure even if we want to do that. So we come to that crisis of belief. Do I walk in obedience or am I going to walk in in disobedience? Am I looking for the right way or am I looking for the seems right way, which is much simpler for me to walk? Now this crisis of belief is, is actually asking, can I trust God in the situation that I'm now experiencing? Can I really trust him in what I'm experiencing now? I know he has done things in the past. I know he has done things in my life. I've experienced his miracles in my life. But this is different. 
It's a different circumstance. Can, can God really come through in this situation? Can he handle this? That brings about the crisis of belief. What do we really believe about God? And if we truly believe, and we certainly should, that God really does know what he's doing, and that he really can, and that he wants to do what he says he's going to do, and that he really knows what's best for us, and that we're going to benefit from our relationship with him because we're walking in obedience with him, then it's worth building that personal relationship that we've talked about throughout this whole series. And that's what he was trying to get the nation of Israel to do. Now the other side of that is, if we don't believe any of that, if we don't believe that God can do what he says he can do, and if we forget everything that he's already done... The other side of of walking in obedience is disobedience. And that brings about a crisis of belief. And we will live in a crisis of belief. And we seem to do pretty well in our relationship with God until this crisis of belief comes into play. And it's really at that point that we discover whether or not our belief about God and our relationship with Him is a conviction or a convenience right? and there's a big difference between a conviction and a convenience a belief of, of convenience is, is one that we take part in when it's convenient for us when it doesn't cost us anything when we don't really have to put out anything it's just there and we, we can do it without any effort doesn't require any commitment doesn't require any accountability We can do it because it's convenient. Now, a belief of conviction is totally different. That's one that that we take part in when it's not convenient, when it's going to cost us something to make a decision, even sometimes when we don't know the direction that we're headed. That's conviction. And the way we make that choice... It's based upon our relationship with God. Do we have a personal love relationship with Him or is it a convenient relationship? Is it a convicted love relationship or is it one of convenience? Well, God takes care of me when I need it, so that's okay. What type of relationship do we have? Do we make our decisions based on the right way or or the seems right way, which in reality is my way? Well, God, I don't really want to do that. God, I'm not prepared to do that. God, I don't want to do that. God, I can't do that. And all of that is, is true. We can't do a lot of what God calls us to do. Israel could not do what God was calling it to do by themselves. But God says, I'm with you, just as he says to you and me, I am with you. Ephesians 2.10 says this about, about us when we face this reality. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared for us to do. And we've talked a little bit about this before. You are God's creation. You are God's workmanship. There's not another like you. He created you for a reason, for a purpose, and He has prepared things for you to accomplish in service and ministry to Him. You're His workmanship. Now, with that thought in mind, it's it's extremely important for us that we sense that God's speaking to us and then we respond in the right way. Israel here is, in this text, is experiencing a crisis of belief brought about by their discontentment and their false information. They were given false information by those who were fearful of the giants and we see by their response to God's call their true belief about him 
when it should have been totally different because of what he had already done for them. Can you imagine what God has already done? They, they'd forgotten all of that. They'd forgotten that, that he brought them out of bondage. They cried out to him, Lord, we're, we're in bondage. Free us from this bondage. Take us out of Egypt. Give us freedom. Take us to a new land. What did God do? That's exactly what he did. He took them out. But they forgot about all of the prayers that had already been answered. And that God had never failed to lead them in the right direction. And they see the proof that the spies brought back to show that God was truthful in his presentation of the promised land. They came back, first of all, with, with an eyewitness account. Now, that's awesome. Hey, here's, here's what we saw, they said. Land is just exactly like God said it would be. It's flowing with milk and honey. It's ours for the taking. Wow. Then they heard the false information. And the false information changed their minds entirely. Now, not only did they hear the eyewitness, but we'll see in just a few moments that they saw the fruit of the land itself. They brought back visible proof to show that the land was exactly like God said it would be. Now, if we truly believe, and we certainly should, that God knows what he's doing, that should not be a crisis of belief for us. But sometimes it is. Sometimes we, we allow the negative to overcome what God has prepared for us. Now, with that thought in mind that we are God's workmanship, that we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, again, which God has prepared for us to do, with that thought in mind, it's extremely important for us when we sense that God is speaking to us that we respond in the right way. Now, Israel in this particular passage is experiencing a crisis of belief, again, brought about by false information and hopefully we can learn from their experience at at least two ways here's the first one the first is that the right response to the call of God requires faith not personal preference and we see in this situation that because of their lack of faith, they fail to enter God's desired plan, his prepared plan for their lives. And simply put, they, they didn't respond properly to what God had called them to do, so they walked in disobedience. It wasn't what they wanted to do. They were fearful of doing what God had told them to do. They had forgotten in totally about what God had done for them already. And they saw this crisis of belief. Oh, we can't do that. We can't do that. There are too many obstacles there. Hebrews 3, 7 says of the people of God in the New Testament in reference to the people of God in the Old Testament. Here's what he says. So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear this voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert where your fathers tested and tried me and for 40 years saw what I did. Then in Hebrews 3.19, we see the results of the people's disobedience. So we see that they were not able to enter the promised land because of their unbelief. God's people today face that same unbelief. We are God's people. We still face that same unbelief. When things are difficult, when things are placed before us that we don't understand, that we can't explain away, things become difficult. That brings about a crisis of belief. And we, like the nation of Israel, totally forget what God has already done. We forget what his promises are. 
the promises that he has kept, he has never failed in his promises. We forget all of that, and we simply say, well, I don't believe that can happen. It's a faith issue, for sure. And the Apostle Paul gives us the source of faith in Romans 10, 17. He says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Well, our faith then comes from our lives being filled with the word of God and fulfilled in our lives. Listen to what Joshua says in chapter 1, verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. There are several songs that have been written here in the last uh, decade about about this and you, you see uh, t-shirts and everything be strong be bold be courageous right that's coming from Joshua 1 9 have I not commanded you be strong and courageous do not be terrified do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go wow now that's Joshua speaking he is giving us the promise that God is with us wherever we go. What does Jesus say in Matthew 28? I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. It hasn't changed a bit, has it? God is with us always in the midst of any circumstance that we might find ourselves dealing with. But here's the question. Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that God is with us in everything, every day? Not just in times of difficulty, but He's with us always, always. Evidently, Israel did not believe it. Listen to Numbers 13, 27 again. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. And again, not only did they see what God said was true, they even brought back the proof so that all of Israel could see it. The spies saw exactly what God told them. They brought proof back to show the people of Israel. But they were still doubting that they could do what God called them to do because they determined that they couldn't do it in spite of what God told them to do. How many times do we fail in that same light? Now, they were absolutely right. They could not go and conquer the land by themselves. But God did not call them to go by themselves. He said, I am with you wherever you go. So God was leading the way. He wasn't falling behind. He wasn't giving them the opportunity to do it on their own. He was leading the way to the land that he had promised them. They failed again to remember that he brought them out of bondage, that he parted the Red Sea. He destroyed the Egyptian army. Now, in spite of everything that God had done, they they were fearful that he couldn't take care of a few giants. Go figure. Right? Here God has had destroyed the entire Egyptian army. He's parted the Red Sea. They walked across, even on dry ground. They didn't even get their feet wet. You know, that's amazing to me. They didn't even get their shoes wet. But I'm not sure God can, I'm not sure he can defeat a few giants over there. Those guys are big, you know. I'm not sure he can do that. That's what Israel was saying. You know, but here's the sad thing. Many times we haven't learned from their mistakes. We still fall into the same category. And we have seen what God has done in the past. We have seen His miracles. We we know His miracles through Scripture. We have experienced them firsthand. But yet when something comes that that we don't fully understand, we, we cower in fear and we doubt that God can be trusted to take care of this particular situation. 
And we respond much in the same way as the people of Israel. We forget what God has already done for us. And we set out on our own. But you know when our lives are filled with God's word. When we can see the proof of his promises. When we can walk in the personal relationship with him. When we can trust what he says he will do. Our faith should skyrocket. There should be nothing that should dampen our faith. But you see, faith is, has got to be more than simply believed. It's got to be applied. And we say, oh, I've got faith. Yeah, I've got, I've got faith. God's got this. Yeah, he's got it. And we crumble at the first sign of difficulty. You see, our faith has got to be acted upon. That's what the world is looking at Christians for right now. The world is a terrible place to, to live in right now. There's not a single country that's not going through something that is so destructive it could destroy the entire nation in which they live. And we, we're right in the middle of that. And the world is, is looking at us. Non-believers are, are looking at us to see if our faith is as strong as we say it is. How are we standing? Are we bold in our proclamation of the gospel? Are we continuing to spread the gospel? There are those today who, if they stand and say, I am a, a believer in Jesus Christ, they are killed immediately. Would we have that same faith this morning? Faith's got to be applied if it's going to grow. Faith doesn't rest in a concept or an idea. It's got to rest in a person, and that person is God himself. And faith is God, in God is, is the only valid faith that we have. And when God calls us out to take a new step or, or step in another direction of faith, a step of obedience in our walk with Him, it, it's generally all new territory for us. We've never been there before. We don't know how we got there. We don't know how we're going to get through it. But we know that we are not by ourselves. According to Joshua and according to Jesus and according to what Scripture says from cover to cover, God is with us always. And that's, that's really what the people of Israel failed to do. They failed to trust God. Their faith was not strong. And they suffered the consequences of their disobedience. And here's something when you really, really think about it. It's somewhat amazing to me. Faith doesn't operate in the realm of what we believe is possible. When we look at, at the struggles uh, of Moses and Joshua, when we look at the struggles of the prophets, when we look at the struggles of, of the disciples, we see that they could not have done what they did were it not for their faith in God. And they relied upon what God had already done. Believing that as he instructed them to move forward, that he was going to take care of the situation. We see what Moses did. We see that, that Joshua took the people across the Jordan River. He brought down walled cities. He defeated powerful enemies. He made the sun stand still. But he had faith. He had the faith like Moses had. And that's the faith that you and I need to have today only God could have done those things now he did them through individuals but only he could have done them just as he works through you and me today Hebrews 13 8 reminds us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever he never changes he never changes now here's the second thing we need to grow in faith Faith also grows with use. 
Listen to what disciples uh, said to Jesus, Luke 17, verses 5 through 6. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. That's kind of a strange, strange response, isn't it? What's that mean? Well, what Jesus is really saying to the disciples here is your problem is that you don't need more faith. You just need to apply the faith that you already have. You need to apply the faith that you already have. And the only faith that God can use is faith that is applied. And if we don't use it, God can't use it. If we don't apply it, God can't use it. Now, God responds to any degree of faith, but his ultimate goal is to grow our faith so we can experience the fullness of the faith that he wants us to experience. And our obedience to what God calls us to do today is going to prepare us for what he's going to call us to do tomorrow. We don't do the little things, so we never get around to doing the big things. And God usually starts with small things. Uh, you didn't start out as the CEO of your company, did you? If you're in the military, you didn't start out as a one-star general. You had to grow to that point. As a believer in Jesus, we didn't start out knowing all the answers, nor are we going to end up knowing all the answers till we get to eternity. But we're going to grow in faith and we're going to mature in our faith. And God is going to use us in many and different ways as we grow and as we walk in obedience to him. You know, my goal, and I hope it's it's your goal as well. And that goal is found in Matthew 25, 23. And Jesus says to the faithful servant in the parable of the talents, who actually did something very simple. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Wow. Judgment day, Jesus is going to say one of two things. He's going to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Or he's going to say, I never knew you. I don't know about you, but I'd like the first response much better. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. That doesn't mean that, that we're perfect. That doesn't mean that we're going to do everything that he calls us to do. But we're striving to, to do that. Because we know he loved us and he is a great God. The scripture tells us we can also see the evidence of faith. James says in chapter 2 verse 26 faith without works is dead and what he's telling us our faith should produce our works as God calls us out God doesn't call us to just sit around and do nothing he didn't call us to sit in a pew every Sunday morning he calls us to live every day for him in the way that he has wired us up in the way that he has gifted us And if we just say we we have faith and do nothing, then our faith is very shallow and it's not growing. It's not going to be any more next year than it is this year if we don't allow it to grow. See, what we do for the Lord says far more about our faith in Him than what we say. And that's what people are looking for, for believers today. They're looking at us to see if our faith is as strong as we say it is. Is this relationship that we say we have with God, is it real? Is it personal? Is it growing? Is it multiplying? Is it reaching people? That's what they're, that's what they're looking at. Is it saying something to me that they might have something that, that I would benefit from, that I would desire, something that I'm missing? They know something is missing, but they don't know exactly what it is until they find Jesus. And
And here's what I want you to understand about this crisis of belief. It's only a crisis if we choose not to believe and obey. It's not a crisis of belief if we believe and if we obey. But it will be if we're disobedient. I want you to remember this, and I've said this for the entirety of my ministry, and I call this theology by Dr. Richard. If it were impossible, God would not call you to do it because he doesn't call you to fail. Right? God wouldn't God doesn't call us to fail. He calls us to succeed. The problem we have is determining what success is. So what's your response? Here's, here's the final question for today. What's your response to the call of God saying about what you believe? Let me repeat that. What's your response to the call of God saying about what you believe? You know, we hear a lot of times today, you know, we, 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 we want to go by the book. But if we're going by any book other than this book, it's a wrong one. It's a wrong one. Father, thank you for sharing with us crisis of belief that the nation of Israel experienced. I pray that we might learn from that. I pray that we do learn from that. And that we'll not allow the circumstances of life or our disobedience to your call to put us in a time of crisis of belief, to put us in a time of fear, I'm afraid, Lord, many uh, today are living in fear, not putting their trust in you, not listening to what you say, traveling the seems right road instead of your road. And Lord, we ask your forgiveness for that as individuals and as churches. Because the world is looking to us at this very moment, in a time of a, a world confusion in which Satan is having his field day. And Father, we need to be bold and, and courageous. We need to be strong in standing and proclaiming the gospel message, even in the face of persecution. We, at this moment, have no idea of the persecution that many Christians are, are facing today. Many have been killed the, already for their belief. But Lord, we applaud them for standing, even in the face of death, to proclaim you as Lord and Savior. I pray that we would have the same courage, the same boldness, to stand in a similar situation. And Father, we do pray for uh, those who may be here today who have no relationship with you. They're seeking, they're looking. They've heard about you, but they haven't accepted you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that if there's a stumbling block there, that you will take that away this morning. That the power of your Holy Spirit might speak to them. They might be convicted of their need for a Savior, realize that you are the Savior. You gave your life on the cross at Calvary to pay the price for our sins. That they might come and receive you this morning. There may be other decisions to be made. Maybe there are some who need to be a part of this church family. Others to just come and pray and say, Lord, here, here I am. And I, I don't want to be in a crisis of belief. I just want to remember everything that you've done in my life and 
the promises that you've made to me in the days to come. Lord, you speak to us during this time. I pray that our hearts are open to hear, to listen, and that we'll respond. And we give you the praise and the glory. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I ask you to stand for our invitation. For the Lord speaking to you, we invite you to come this morning. You make that decision he's placed upon your life. The worship team's going to lead us. You come so the Lord speaks to you. Let's sing together. sing verse 3. Now the daylight flees, now the crown beneath, wakes as its labor bows his head, curtain torn in two, dead are raised to seated for just a moment. Uh, Pete and Alina, come and stand with me if you would. You saw the fiasco of me trying to get my pen out of my pocket. That's, that's really embarrassing, you know, standing in front of a bunch of people, and especially when you're online and you can't get your pen out of your pocket, and uh, everybody's trying to wonder, what's that fool doing, you know? Uh, so, so I'm trying to get my pen out of my pocket, if you were wondering what that was, was all about. Uh, <laughs> Pete and uh, Elena Johnson come to uh, unite with us today by their statement of faith. They've been coming for some time, and uh, they are coming to unite with us in our fellowship today. If you're excited about their decision to join with us, signify by saying amen. 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 All right. 
They've got the cutest little guy downstairs you've ever seen. Uh, he's bright-eyed, and, man, he's, he's wide open when he comes to church. And uh, I just love seeing him, and I know they love him down in the, the nursery. And he started yesterday getting ready to come to church today. So uh, that's the excitement we all, we all should have. So I want you to come, and uh, uh, at least on the way out, and uh, introduce yourself and welcome them into our church family, I know we have some other little business here to take care of in just a minute, but uh, as we vote on our deacons, but uh, uh, make sure that you uh, introduce yourself to them, and uh, they, they've come to join with us, and they're our responsibility now to minister to them, so I pray that we do that, okay? All right, God bless you. Have a, a great week. Y'all, y'all can be seated there if you like, and uh, then the deacons will come in just a, a few second here to do that. I guess you're ready. I am ready. You're ready. All right. All right. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Right. A couple of brief announcements before our deacons come forward to give us our um, election God ballots. Uh, we are continuing to take offerings in the foyer. If you uh, desire to give in that fashion, there's uh, containers out there for you. Uh, I want to remind you of March for Life on Friday, uh, September 17th. We'll probably leave around 10. Just let me know if you uh, would like to join us. Uh, my email, my phone number is in the bulletin. You can contact me that way, and then we'll get you signed up. Uh, also, uh, want to remind you that our Christmas co- choir is now practicing. If you would like to sing with us, uh, the glorious light of Christmas, we would love to have you. So come and join us uh, Wednesdays at uh, six thirty. We'd love you to join us there as well. Uh, live stream. Uh, every once in a while, uh, the guy who runs our live stream, Jim, cannot be here, and then Jan has to do double duty. Uh, It's very difficult for her. So we are opening up a new position in our sound booth uh, just to run the live stream. That only happens during the second service. If you would like to be uh, one of the people to do, you don't have to do it all by yourself. I'm hoping I'll get enough volunteers and we have several people to do it. It's real easy to do um, when it works. If it doesn't work, it's not your fault, but most of the time it works. Uh, but I'd love to get you in here and teach you how to do it and, and uh, get an extra person. It's very difficult for Jan to run both of those at one time. So if you are interested, again, my uh, phone number, uh, my um, uh, email address is all in the Pastor Chuck, and you can just send that to me. Our deacons for today. Chris Terman and Brian Doerr. Brian is going to come up. He's going to close us in prayer. Then our deacons are going to come up and down the aisle. They're going to give you ballots. Once you've uh, uh, voted, put those in the envelopes. You can hand those in out in the foyer. We have baskets and people out in the foyer to collect those. And come up and say hi to the Johnsons, if you would. And guys, we'll welcome you to welcome you to our church. I did get that right, correct? Okay, good, good. Uh, sometimes uh, I forget names, so I got it right. Okay, Brother Brian, if you would. Thank you, Pastor Chuck. Uh, church, it was great to see you today. It was great to uh, worship with you. If you would join, please join me in prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here today in this building as a corporate body to worship you. We thank you for welcoming us uh, into your presence, not by anything that we have done, Lord, but by the blood of Jesus shed for us that you can welcome us into your presence. For we are a sinful people. And I ask you, Lord, to uh, please break our hearts over our sins uh, and bring to our minds even those those little sins, uh, the little white lies, the things done in secret that we think that we're getting away with, Lord. Give us a broken and a contrite spirit. Make us, make us like clay in the hands of the potter, Fashion us, Lord, into a tool that you can use uh, to build your kingdom. It's all about Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray today. Amen.